Now, what about a deficit? Well, people go on and on about a deficit. Okay, too big, too small. Normally too big, people say. All of that stuff is all wrong. Why is it wrong? The reason being that the government's deficit must be the non-government sector's surplus. If it's not, sack the accountant. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard author and MMT scholar Phil Armstrong giving an MMT presentation organised by the Gower Initiative for Modern Money Studies. And we'll be hearing that in just a moment. In the show notes, I've linked to the Gower Initiative for Modern Money Studies website, which is where you'll be able to watch the video of this presentation when it becomes available. It might take a few days to get uploaded. So with kind permission from Prue and Sarah and Claire from GIMS, we've put this audio out as soon as we could so people who weren't able to attend can have a listen at their earliest convenience. And that's why we're putting this episode out early Sunday instead of Wednesday. Our next episode will go out to the public on Wednesday the 19th of August, but it will be available sooner than that for early listening on our Patreon feed. So the GIMS website is also where you can sign up for their mailing list so you can get updated every time they organize an MMT event, but more importantly, If you're able to support them financially, the link I've used goes right to where you need to be to be able to do that. In the Q&A section of the event, there was a question about government bonds. And for anybody that wants more info on that, I've linked to our episodes with Dr. Stephen Hale on understanding government bonds. Also, there was a question about former Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell's view of MMT. So I've linked to principal MMT architect Bill Mitchell's account of the meeting he had with John McDonnell in 2018, which he wrote up in his blog. And for good measure, I've also linked to our previous episodes with Phil himself. As ever, there's a link in the show notes to where you can support this podcast via Patreon. Support starts at a dollar a month, which is 77 British pence at the time of recording. And no matter what level of support you give us, you get early access to all our shows and patron-only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. Finally, as ever, thanks for the time you put into understanding and thinking about and spreading the word on MMT. So, we start with opening remarks from Prue Plumridge of GIMS. Let's dive in. Welcome to GIMS' first online event. We're really delighted to have you with with us wherever you are, Uh, from myself uh, and from my little workroom. I feel like I'm on the Costa Brava, sweltering in the heat. Now, looking to the positives, however, in this time of COVID, we haven't had to travel any further than our homes to attend. No trains, no buses, no more cars, traffic jams, or public transport delays, and no expenses. On the other hand, meeting you all in person is something that we at GIMS will miss. Now, looking at the list of attendees, it seems that this might be the first event that some of you will have attended. So for those of you who don't know who we are, our organisation was formed a couple of years ago, and It was formed with the objective of providing an educational platform to challenge the economic orthodoxy of the last four and more years. We are a non-profit organization and funded solely by public donation. We are supported by, by distinguished economists and many other experts who have played a vital role in offering advice and guidance in the development of this project. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare the damaging consequences of the last four decades and more of economic orthodoxy, which has influenced the policies of successive governments, widened wealth and income inequality, created huge 
economic, social, and political uncertainty, and highlighted the very real human cost of austerity and cuts to public spending in every part of our public and social infrastructure, from our NHS uh, and social care system, to which has been overwhelmed uh, in the last few months, to our decimated public services, which have been stretched to their limit. And of course, let's not forget local government, which has been able, unable to respond effectively to the challenges posed by COVID-19. Society has paid a heavy price for economic orthodoxy and household budget descriptions of how governments spend. So from being told endlessly by politicians that austerity and budget cutting was necessary to get the public finances back into good order over the last few months, government has spent vast sums of money to stabilise the economy and to avoid the worst case scenario of a deep and protracted recession and prospect of mass unemployment. So where did that money come from? If we ask one question, if money was in short supply before COVID-19, where did the government get the wherewithal to gallop to the rescue of the economy? Did they have to borrow it? And will there be a heavy price to pay in higher taxation in the future? These are the questions that after the big spend are now being reintroduced back into the public conversation, that of how it is to be paid for. However, if nothing else, this calamity has finally exposed the lie of austerity. And with the future challenges we face in addressing climate change and fixing wealth inequalities, now is the time to lay bare the false narratives about how government spends and quash the notion that there is a finite pot of money. We need as a matter of urgency to explore what makes for a balanced economy, how we can move towards a sustainable green economy, provide jobs, universal basic services, and tackle poverty and inequality. So Gims is therefore very pleased and delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Phil Armstrong, who is uh, an associate member of IMS and author of the uh, book, Can Economics Make a Difference to be published later this year. Now, Phil will be happy to take written questions after his presentation, which can be placed uh, through the chat head at the bottom of the screen. Um, he's asked uh, me to ask you to keep your questions short and sharp so that we can make the best use of the time we have available. So without further ado, over to you, Phil. Right, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me go like thumbs up if you can hear me, members of the audience? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, there might be a slight delay of people joining uh, as England approach a very improbable victory. You know, at Old Trafford, it looks as though, you know, they were dead and buried five down. Uh, I think Butler's just gone LBW, so it's a tense finish. So we might expect a few bells ringing, perhaps, you know, when the match is over. Hopefully England can get those last 20 runs or so, we'll see. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I uh, I've my name is Phil Armstrong, as uh, Prue said. I've uh, I taught economics from 1981 through to 2014, and then I retired uh, for about an hour. And then I got a ring from a further education college saying, Come teach engineering. Uh, and I said, I've done anything about engineering, and I'm now approaching my sixth year teaching engineering. I've really enjoyed it. Part of the reason I like it is, as far as I know, the stuff I'm teaching the kids is all right. I want you to think about it. When I was teaching economics, most of the stuff was all wrong. Right? So that's quite difficult. You know, they paid me a lot, and well, a fair amount, you know. Um, and the kids did okay in A-levels and stuff. But a lot of the material, it wasn't great. Um, so consequently, I'll, I'll have my doubts about mainstream economics, if you like. Uh, I've come across uh, modern monetary theory about 10 years ago. I started corresponding with Warren Mosler, the founding thinker, along with Bill Mitchell. 
Uh, I got into MMT, and I think it's a fantastic insight or lens into the world, very persuasive. Uh, and uh, my interest in MMT has grown with that. I've obviously met the, the Gims girls, um, a very inspiring group of people. You know, please have a look on their website. Fantastic articles are on there. Uh, I'm not just talking about mine. They're probably the weak link in the chain. There are a lot of great articles on there. Conferences they run are fantastic. Uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this one. Uh, the, a word of warning, I'm not very good at tech. I, I'm normally, I love the sound of my own voice like most teachers. My wife would tell you that, you know. So, and I look at this, when I'm teaching, I look at the students' eyes. How are they, you know, are they enjoying it? Are they looking sleepy? Do they want a joke? I can't see you guys. So I apologize if I go too fast, too slow. You know, it's the first time I've fronted a Zoom conference. I've taught at least 30,000 lessons. So just think about that. I'm that old, but I've never hosted a Zoom conference like this, like taught to people I can't see. I hope there's more than four people there. So away we go. So you'll see on the screen, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about monetary theory, what it is, and how it gives us a vision of the future in the post-COVID economy. Now, I'm aware there's going to be different people watching. I might have people who are not economists, never heard of MMT. They just think, what is this MMT everyone's talking about excitedly? So I'm going to introduce them to MMT. There'll be people who are all favorites, friends of mine, part of the MMT community. They just know all the stuff I'm going to say. They're just joining in just sort of moral support for Gims and me. Thank you for coming, if that's you. There might be critics out there, those who are you know, think that they know more than MMT is and they want to pot shot at the old man, you know. Well, I'm a teacher, I've taught bottom set year nine, Friday afternoon, bring it on. I can't see your face, but send me the questions. Love it. And there might be sort of people who are maybe academics who are just having a look just to see how it goes. And plus a few other groups of people, um, maybe too nervous to watch the uh, Denouement, the England game, and have just joined in just for something to do to take the nerves away. So we we'll see how we go. So this is where we are. Right. My screen isn't moving. Ah, right. It's working. So first glitch, right, what I'm going to do first is look briefly at the failure of mainstream economics, like why does there need to be an MMT? Because mainstream economics delivers the goods, you know. If we had full employment, no inflation, a world where, you know, people were happy, there was no poverty, we'd all be giving these mainstream economists a huge round of applause. You know, imagine if inequality was falling, People all over the world were reaping the, re the rewards of their efforts. We think the theoreticians who are informing policy to back this up, they'd be great guys. Hasn't happened, as Prue said. So I'll look a little briefly at that. Then I'll introduce MMT, as I said, at a fairly basic level. You know, I might nudge into more technical areas. Uh, if anyone wants to ha has technical questions, fire them at me at the end. And then finally, the crucial area, if you like, the brief of the talk is for me to look at um, what the insights of MMT can bring to this post-COVID world. You know, we don't know what the new normal is, but whatever it is, what, what, what can MMT tell us about it? Um, my PhD, I've just done a PhD in old age. I've got a supervisor who's about 10 years younger than me. Uh, We've written, uh, um, which is rather nice. Uh, I just have to behave myself. And I've done okay, I think, I hope. Anyway, and um, we've written a, a book together, uh, papers together and the various things. But uh, this is a quote from an article that Nick Potts, my supervisor, and I have written. Uh, in the neoliberal period, that's around 1980, the present day, Primacy of markets has been supported and being preached by mainstream economics, defined by a deep seated mistrust of the economic competence of the state and the lauding of market forces, including privatization, outsourcing, ever lengthening global supply chains. You've heard all this before. 
In this paper, the paper that we write, we consider economic theory can help us understand COVID-19, the crisis, uh, and if important lessons be learned, what, what might this lead to in terms of policy? We argue it's time for informed change. So my supervisor is a TSSI Marxist, okay? He's got deep-seated insights, he would add, but this talks all about MMT. You know, hopefully you'll get a chance to read stuff that Nick and I have written. So this is the idea that we lived in a world where the market is king. The idea that if you deregulate, let the markets alone, this will provide us all with a wonderful life. You know, it's a bit like the title of that movie, isn't it? You know, with James Stewart, my favourite. Get your markets, sit back, do nothing, boy. And it's a wonderful life. So it's not. We've not had a wonderful life. We've had grow massive inequality across the world, you know, ridiculous statistics where you got 62 people have got as much wealth as half the world, poverty across the world, all these things that, you, well, most people think are crazy, and they've been happening in the neoliberal period. So markets maybe aren't quite as good as they've been suggested. Uh, Sarah asked me to put these uh, slides on from the Green Party comments. Now, if you imagine, right, I don't want to be too technical about it, but imagine all the guys in the old Bank of England, all right? They do these fan charts. Now, this is 2006. You can see where the line ends. So that's the growth of the British economy, 2006. So all these clever guys, and boy, they are clever, cleverer than me. They beat the top universities. Most of them are at the top of the class, you know? All those Latin names, the American, you know, something come louder. They've all got all these sorts of prizes, you know, first class honours degrees, all the, tri all the trimmings, mainstream economists. And they all look at all the data and they use all their complex models. And they think, right, where the dark green is, is the most likely to happen. And the paler it is, the less likely it is. Now, you'll know, it's like uh, if you're interested in maths, they don't give anything a zero possibility. It's like an asymptote, you know. So the further away you get from just under three, the less likely it is. So what they're saying, all this mainstream maths, all those little squiggles, bound. this is what we think. So you can rest assured we know what we're doing. So they're using their models. They're predicting in 2006, look, this is what it'd be like. Sit back, make your plans, put your feet up. Have a beer, all right? Everything's in, in under our control. Bang! Whoa, where did that come from? I mean, like, where did it come from? I mean, that's what they said. Think about that, that's right. So that wasn't even on the radar. I mean, it wasn't, it's completely off the scale. And they're making this prediction for the future in 2011 now so they you'll notice that they've gone back to the models now so they've still got basically the same idea the grip around three now you might say don't they just put that bit on there and pretend they've worked it out now i'll leave you to think about that so obviously they have no idea what they're doing i mean come on look at that so you would have thought wouldn't you they would have been sacked. All right, I was a green pot, so I've said, if you build a bridge, it collapses. Build another one, it collapses. Build another one, it collapses. You might get the engineers in your office and say, look, boys and girls, I'm not too happy with those bridges. You know, they keep collapsing. I, I think you might have to go back to the drawing board. So they're still there. All right. So... I look at that little quote there from J.K. Galbraith in economics, the majority are always wrong. Okay, now I'm in the minority. Okay, now, and, and Prue and Claire and Sarah, we're in the minority. So you might argue in the future when we are the majority, okay, might we be wrong? Possibly, but it's a long way off. So let's worry about when we get there. For now, let's say that we're in the minority and I'm saying we're right. The mainstream don't know what they're doing. Why have they not been booted out? Well, one of the reasons is that the, the profession is so anti-academic freedom that any new ideas are just squashed at source. 
because the type of economics that is taught, if you're good at it, you know, you get a, a professorship in it, well, well, why would you change? You're doing well. If you go to the top universities, you get a great career out of it. And also, most of the time, governments only pay lip service to economics anyway, so their very irrelevance actually helps them. They're wrong. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Now, I'll come back to the Copernicus idea. When Copernicus changed our notion of the solar system completely, he said it was the sun at the middle, not the earth. It's a big thing. Okay, now MNT is like that. All right, it is like that. Now, it upsets the mainstream. They do not like it. All right. I was involved in a Twitter debate with a, a mainstreamer. Um, and he said to me, well, it annoys us because you're telling us like, you, you know, uh, you try to reinvent the wheel. You're telling us the obvious thing. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling a guy who's been using square wheels throughout his career. You've got to start using a round one. Now, people don't like, particularly old guys, no offense, I'm oldish myself, that don't like being told they're wrong. And not only wrong in a little way, wrong in like a big way. Their whole model's wrong. They don't like it. They get upset. They're wedded to it. But I'm saying mainstream economics is wrong, period. Okay? Big claims, like old Copernicus, he made big claims. Did he make him popular? No. It, RMMT is trying to be popular with mainstream economists. No. Can they appear adversarial? Yeah, because that's the nature of it. Are they, though, kind, nice, polite people like me, like Prue, like Sarah, like Claire? Yes, we're nice people. All right. We think we are. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we are. So we're nice people, but we are adversarial. Because when you see ideas that are wrong and dangerously wrong, you've got to confront them. Right. Then I'll move on to sort of the base of MMT. Now, when you think about fiscal policy, for economists, you'll know what I'm talking about, you know, your eyes, no, he's not going to do on about that. But for ordinary people who are not burdened with an economic training, they think, well, you know, fiscal policy, that's all about taxing and spending. All right. Now, most people think, as it was alluded to by Prue, that, um, well, the government, in a way, is like us. It's just bigger. So it gets money in first, and it gets that in through taxes, all right, or possibly borrowing. Not sure where. It borrows it from somewhere, all right? Maybe foreign foreigners, not exactly sure about it. It makes us nervous. Maybe people are going to come in the night, you know, and take away the crown jewels, you know, put the queen in hock to repay up. We're borrowing money. We don't really know where it's from. A lot of people have got a vague idea there's like a big bank somewhere, but it's a mean bank. It's called the IMF. They haven't noticed that it's called International Monetary Fund. I haven't noticed that. But it's a bank, and I think that's where people go, countries go, when they've run out of money. All right? That, I'm not saying most people, but those who thought about it a bit at night, if they're nervous. So the idea then is most people have got an idea in their head, all right, Government's like a massive household just on a bigger scale, all right? So what we do is we get wages and we get credit if we borrow it, and then we use that, obviously, to make our spend, spending decisions. Same with the government. It funds itself, in inverted commas, through tax and borrowing. So it's just on a bigger scale, all right? It's got better, better credit, you know? As that, uh, David Cameron, not a great economist, all right? Some people think he's not a great prime minister either, but we won't go into that. But all that, we'll have to go capping in to the IMF and we've maxed our credit cards. I mean, come on. If you wrote that in an essay, year 10 essay, I'm not talking about A-level. I'd have to have an interview with me before I'd let him do A-level. He'd have to shape up and look as though he's got a chance of getting at least an E. But with stuff like that, come on, you're joking. Right, here's a question. Where does the private sector, if you view the private sector as a whole, get the money it needs to pay taxes? Now, obviously we're doing things in reverse a little bit from the way people normally think. Now, if I were in a conference hall, I would take people's answers to these questions. 
you know, and people would put their hand up and I'd say, so I'm going to kind of play the other role. I'm going to pretend I'm trying to answer my own question. So if I do this, usually there'll be a middle-aged person in the audience who's quite brave, puts their hand up. Well, I get it off, uh, I get it off me firm. Right, okay, because so they pay you out of their profits. Yeah, yeah, and then I pay me taxes. And then I say, where does your firm get it from? And they go, well, they sell stuff. I say, well, well, how can they do that? Oh, well, other people have been earning money. So you get the idea that money goes round the system. But uh, And then I, I often will say, well, it's a bit like the plumbing in your house. You know, the water moves round the pipes in your house. But how does it get in there? The water comes from the mains. Agreed? Can't see. He's got a nod and... I can see Ade. So if you nod Ade, I know you're with me if I'm pronouncing your name right. So, result. Now, so what we're saying is that the money changes, moves around the system. Okay. And it can be, and it's, you know, taxes can be paid. But I said, well, how does it get in there in the first place? And people go, well, well, that's a bit tricky because would you agree? The government can only take in tax when it's already spent. Otherwise, it's counterfeiting. Do you see what I mean? So you think about it, and I talked to the Green Party, those are here, uh, about a movie I'd seen about an old couple who used to forge American banknotes. All right? Now, they didn't get caught for years because they only used a few. But counterfeiting state money, it's illegal. So the question really is, the government can't collect money, can it? Unless it's already spent it. We couldn't do it, all right? If I went in my loft and start making money, pay me tax, I'd get arrested. So the government has to spend money into the system before it can collect it in taxes. Now, one of the things is with our system, with all the banks and the central bank, it gets a little bit confusing. So what I normally like to do is to think a little back, a little bit into history. It's the same basic principles apply. So if we go back into history, I might choose a ran random event. All right, let's take, for example, the Romans, okay? If you've got an emperor, now, would you agree he's got a choice as an emperor? He could use his power, or she could use the power to demand lots of stuff be, be delivered to them, all right, and have a big administrative complex and say, right, I want grain, I want weapons, I want jewels, I want everything. Everybody has to go out bureaucratic and bring me all these things. Now, to an extent, that's what used to happen in Mesopotamian countries and ancient Egypt. Okay, I'll, I'll leave you to study the anthropology. It's very interesting. Now, much easier, though, would you agree, if you're a Roman emperor, instead of having this very complex system, why don't you issue money? So the first thing you do, number one is, you levy a tax burden on the population. So if you imagine there isn't any money, just for simplicity's sake, so you get it right in your head, right? There's no money exists. So what you do first is, you levy a tax liability on the population. So you might say to the villagers, you've got to pay me five coins, all right? With, uh, I don't know, five sesterces, okay? Whether that's a reasonable amount for a Roman citizen to pay, I don't know. I'm just, I just remember the name. Now, would you agree at this point, the Roman citizens have not got any coins. You haven't issued them. They know they've got a tax liability and the Roman tax collectors are coming to collect them, but they haven't got any. Can they mint them themselves without the emperor's permission? You look through the history books. What do emperors think about guys who are minting the emperor's coins without permission? They don't like it. So all these villagers are a tad nervous, aren't they? They're thinking, well, when the tax collectors come, I have got no coins to pay them. So now the emperor's in a strong position. He knows the villagers are desperate to get coins they haven't got. So he can get a big army. And he can pay him in the coins. And his army will accept these coins. Not, I repeat, not because they might have some precious metal in them, all right? Most of them had very little. Some had a bit. All right, that's a different story. 
Most of them didn't. Why do soldiers accept the coins? Not because they understood NMT. For the basic rules, they know they can go into the villages and buy what they want. Wine, women, and song. All right? That's what they did. Okay? So they'd work for the emperor in the army 25 years, being paid in, in Roman coins, and there's billions of them out there. And what would happen is the emperor spends the coins, the soldiers earn them by fighting and invading, okay? They go into the villages, they buy what they want, the villages accept them because they know they're going to have to accept them to pay the taxes. Now, the tax collectors didn't collect all the coins, all right? So that what was left at the villages, they could then buy and sell things with. Now, if you think about a tax collector, if a tax collector collected more than he or she should, they were hated, weren't they, by the population. Why? Because that was their wealth. They were going to buy things with after taxes. All right? So the tax collectors were not popular. They would hand over then the taxes. So the crucial thing is the emperor, all right, can only collect in tax what he has already spent. Now, when he gets them back, all right, he could, he could reissue the same coins if he wanted to. Or if he's a new emperor, he can melt them all down, put a new guy's head and spend them again, the same process. All right, and if you're a Roman coin collector, and I've been known to collect a few, that's how the system works. Now, this is the trick. Would you agree that if the Roman emperor spent tons of coins, okay, on his army, and he didn't collect any back, all right, he was too nice, he didn't collect any, what's going to happen? Firstly, his Roman soldiers won't come work for him no more. Because they, well, I've got loads of coins, all right, so I don't need to work for you anymore. Secondly, crucially, if he spends a load of coins and doesn't collect them back, when you go into the villages as a soldier to buy the stuff you want, the villagers will say, I don't need them, I've got loads. All right, so forget it. And if you do want to buy anything off me, you're going to have to give me an awful lot of those coins because I've got loads of them anyway. Inflation. All right. So in other words, the Roman emperor must spend sufficient and collect sufficient. Now, we take the reverse. OK, if the Roman emperor spends a ton of the coins and collects nearly all of them back, by the time people have collected, have given paid their taxes, they've got hardly any left. Nothing left to spend. So people who are relying on these tax-paying citizens buying things off them, like their new set of sandals or a nice Roman equivalent pizza, closed. No business. Oh, dear. Now, the same principle. Whoa, it applies today. Exactly the same thing. All right? Now, in simple terms, okay, the government issues the currency, all right, by data entry. Now, I'm not saying Rishi's got a computer like me and he does it all himself, but effectively, that's what happens. When the government wants to spend, it issues the currency, and that's the starting point. It does not come from anywhere in the same way that when the Roman emperors issued the currency, they got the coins and they minted them themselves. They didn't come from anywhere, they didn't collect them from anywhere. They issued them first. So the thinking of the household's the wrong way round. Do you see what I mean? So nowadays then, all right, for the British government, it spends through data entry. All right? What would happen is, if I was paid a teacher's salary, all right, someone somewhere presses a button, my credit balance my bank goes up, so they give me a thousand quid, very generous. So I've now got a credit of a thousand in my bank, HSBC. And at the same time, my bank, HSBC, acquires a thousand pounds of bank reserves. So the balance sheet of HSBC expands a thousand either way. When I pay my taxes, let's say I, I paid 500 back, my credit balance drops to 500, and my bank's Reserves drop by 500, and there's a credit uh, that switches to the government's account, the central bank. It's just an accounting transfer. So when the government spends, it does not get anything from anywhere. That is the beginning of the process. The government spends by data entry. Taxes then merely destroy what's already been spent.
Okay? So you have to get out of this idea in people's minds that the government's like a giant household. It isn't. There is no analogy. Now, Margaret Thatcher, all right, and a lot of right-wingers, I'm not, it's not a conspiracy theory, and I'll come to that later, they conceptualise the government like a household because it suits their political purposes, but it isn't. There is no traction. The government must issue, spend or lend, before it can tax or borrow. There can be no other way, all right? Now, you may have questions about that, okay? That's fine. Obviously, a little aside, you might say, well, what about the Eurozone? Now, the Eurozone's different because the Eurozone isn't, the countries, individual countries, are no longer currency issuers. They're currency users, effectively. It's not quite as simple as that. There are various things that have happened in the Eurozone. But essentially, the currency issuer is not the nation state, it's the European Central Bank. Um, Obviously, if you're very interested in the Eurozone, you can ask me a question about that, but there are different rules. They're a bit more like US states in the way that they have to fund themselves. Uh, but in a country like Britain or the US or Japan or Australia, where all currency issues, our government spend through data entry and then taxes are merely taken back by the destruction. But the same rules. So, for example, if we add inflation, through excess demand, and you can get inflation other ways, okay, then you'd know your net spending was too great, just like the Roman emperors. All right, it's exactly the same. So if we say we had inflation in 5% because we're all, we're all so rich, then the government can either cut spending or raise taxes, depending on its politics. If then we've got unemployment, we need to either raise spending or cut taxes, depending on your politics. I'm a left winger, so I generally go for raise spending, or maybe a bit of both. Depends where the taxes were. But that's another story. Okay. Now there's all the sums. Ah, oh, you can use your bank. You can use bank money to pay taxes. All right. So you can go to the bank, borrow some money, and pay taxes. So that means the government doesn't have to spend or lend. That's wrong. All right. Wrong with the capital W. It looks like that, but it's not. Because if you borrow some money or you've got some money in your bank, like, for example, 500 quid, all right? When you, if you want to use your 500 quid to pay your taxes, your liability or deposit falls by 500, yeah. But the settlement of the tax liability comes when your bank pays the government the 500 reserves. So if your bank, didn't have an overdraft at the central bank, which is part of the state structure, you couldn't pay it. What effectively, functionally you're doing is you're paying the bank 500 quid, which is your credit on them. So you go in the bank and say, look, I've got a bank deposit of 500 quid. I've got a credit on you. I'm giving that to you. They're your agent. So they go, okay, then. Acting as your agent, they then shift their 500 pound of reserves to pay your tax bill. All right. It's not quite the same, but imagine you were 15 years old and you thought you would have a, a drink of beer for the first time. So you pay your 18 year old brother to go and buy it for you. He's acting as your agent. All right. It's not a direct transaction. All right. If your bank refused to do it, you couldn't do it. Now, normally speaking, if your bank's a decent bank, solid bank, when you use your 500 quid, your bank's got an overdraft of the central bank, so it doesn't matter, all right? So it looks that way, but it's an illusion, all right? You can't use bank money to directly settle a, a tax credit, all right? People say that. They're just plain wrong, okay? You've got to look at the balance sheets to work that out. And if you think about the same logic, the government has to spend or lend before it can tax the same logic in Roman times, same logic now. It's just harder to see it. Do you see what I mean? So don't be fooled by that, okay? Uh, uh, and it's a criticism that's levied MMT. And what people try and do is say that, oh, the central bank isn't part of the government. Of course, it's part of the government sector, all right? The, the central bank can't do what it wants. It's, it can't, it's a currency issue in bank. It can't, right, we're just going to buy Venezuela or we're going to buy a fleet of yachts you know, because with the currency issue, it's under the aegis of the nation, whether it's owned or not like Britain. So it, it works with the government, the treasury, 
every day, every hour, they're a partnership. All right, the central bank might have a little bit of leeway to do things like interest rate setting, but the idea is an independent agent can do what it's want. Come on, who we try to kid? Okay, if you look at the data, you look at the way these things work. The best way of thinking about a central bank is a scorekeeper. That's what it is. All right, it, it moves balances up and down. It's like a dry spreadsheet under the aegis of the state. So. A good way of thinking about taxes is this. I've said that we, we, we spend, okay? Uh, we accept money initially, you know, many years ago, it's ingrained in us now because we know we pay our taxes with it. I'm not saying people think about that now. It's instinctive, all right? You don't go to, I don't know, someone gives you 10 quid from them. Oh, great, I'll accept that because I can pay me taxes with it. I'm not saying that. Obviously, it's there. It underpins the system. A good way of thinking about taxes is, it makes room for things. For example, if we had full employment, okay, so all the money we got, including bank money that isn't available for direct settlement of taxes, as I said, plus state money, all that's been spent and all our real resources have been used, okay, the government might think, well, I need to get hold of some of those real resources to have a better health service during COVID, for example. So it raises taxes. When it raises taxes, our spending falls. So some of the real resources we were buying are now free. So the government can buy those by data entry. It doesn't use our taxes. It makes us poorer, if you like, by taxes so that we can't utilize our spending power to utilize as many real resources. So they're freed up, made room, they can use them. That's the way it works. So in a way, you can think about it. This is one of the insights of MMT. It comes very much from Warren Moser's idea that fundamentally, taxes are there to provision the state. All right? So that's what we do. Put a tax liability on first. Once you've got a tax liability, people have to go and work for the state to get the money to pay their taxes. Automatically, then, you've created the amount for the currency. Resources then can be moved from the private sector to the public sector. Okay, now the amount you do that is politics, isn't it? If you're a left winger, you think there should be more resources moved to the public sector. If you're a libertarian, as little as possible. And that's a political question. But that's a, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how the system actually works. So, as we said, then if you think about taxes and spending, it's more. To, it's about regulating demand. Too much net spending, inflation too little net spending, unemployment, okay? Right, so, as you said, to get it wrong, okay, if the net spending is too low, either taxes are too high, spending too low, you get unemployment, not enough spending in the economy, or if they do too much, you get inflation. So it's a tricky job, I'm not saying it's easy, but it helps if you understand how the system works, you know? So that type of thing. It's very, very important. Also, you can get, can't you, inflation from cost push. So in the sense, if you imagine, say, that the oil price went up or the price of food went up and that caused the prices to go up, well, that's got nothing to do with too much demand. So you mustn't think, oh, well, too much demand because food prices have gone up. So you've got to be able to distinguish. That's clever. You've got to think about the source of inflation. It's complicated. It's, a, it's got multiple causes. The old Milton Friedman, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. No, of course it's not. You know, he's an ideologue. He got it wrong, okay? Um, now, what about the deficit? Well, people go on and on about the deficit, okay? Too big, too small. Normally too big, people say. Well, the... All of that stuff is all wrong. Again, I've used the word wrong a lot. Why is it wrong? The reason being that the government's deficit must be the non-government sector's surplus. If it's not, sack the accountant. All right, so if I'm the government, I've got my, I've got my little computer and I press. So if I keyed in a million quid into my little economy, which is all my audience that I can't see, and I tax back 800,000, would you agree? I got a deficit of 200,000. 
Yeah, who's got it? You have. So your surplus must be my deficit, 200 grand. If it's not, I get the accountant in the office and say, you've missed something, mate. You have to stay late. I'm not letting you go home until you find out. And it has to add up, right? So does the size of the deficit itself matter? Because it doesn't. If I've got unemployment, then it's not big enough. If I've got inflation, because you guys are also rich, it's too big. Result. It's easy. So when that idiot... Uh, what's he called? I've forgotten his name now. Hammond, when he's on about, oh, I've run a surplus, even though you got unemployment, he expects you're going to say that he's done well, he's done bad, he's taken away our net saving offers. So, in other words, his tax is too much or not spent enough. Stupid, doesn't understand the system. Okay? Now, what about the debt? Well, what's the debt then? Well, would you agree if you, if you acquired a debt one week, 10 quid, you acquired a debt the next week, Another 10 quid. Another debt the next week, another 10 quid. I won't keep going because the mask is difficult. Would you, after three weeks, you've got, you got a, a, a total debt of 30 quid? The deficit the first week, 10. The deficit the next week, 10. The deficit the next, next week, 10. Total debt. That's what national debt is. Technically, it's all money the government's ever spent and not taxed back. All right, now we might be holding it in banknotes. Yeah, that's possible. It might be in bank reserves, but most likely we've used it to switch it to government bonds. They're an asset. So when you get these sort of crazy guy right wingers, you know, the, the flat earthers or whatever you want to call them, what they do is they add up the national debt and say that's a burden to us all. What? You know, I think I used to watch Frasier uh, and there was a, 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 a program there where uh, Martin Crane, who's Frasier's dad, said, gee, what a lovely burden. Now, he, it's because when he's going to live with his son, but I won't go into that. But essentially, in this case, it's true. Gee, what a lovely burden. You know, if you, you know, I know it's maybe you've got a grandchild, uh, Eight, I can see you, I can pronounce your name, possibly you have, uh, and you go to your grandchild, you say, right, uh, here you are then, here's a, a £200,000 government bond. Does the grandchild, you give me a right burden there, granddad, the <laughs> result, bring it on. We love government debt, okay? So the national debt is not bad, it's good. The bigger, the better, up to a point. You might say, well, surely it must get too big. Yeah, same as before. If the nest, na, na, if you imagine, if the national debt is massive and everybody's got so much money in bonds that don't do any work, like, say, uh, AIDS, the only guy I can see, say he gives all his grandchildren a million quid in government bonds so they don't do any work. Well, not good. Good for them, but not for the rest of us. So the national debt, if he gets so big, but we're all so rich, we don't produce any enough. We get inflation. Yeah, we, are we anywhere near that? No. So what I'm saying is the size of the deficit and the size of the national debt in of themselves mean nothing. It's functional. We might have a learner. If we've got unemployment, the size of the deficit, and by implication, the debt, too small, if we've got inflation or excess demand, is too big. Simple. And also for, for the economists among you, the size of the deficit is endogenous anyway. It's determined within the system. You know, when the system's doing well, your tax revenues go up. All right, you don't have as many welfare payments, so your deficit tends to shrink. And then the same, the automatic stabilizers in reverse. And then when you've got a recession, you know, your government spending goes up, your tax revenues go down, pick it down. That's good. It helps to smooth it out. You don't need to, to fight against the Nash the thing. It's crazy, you know? And with, with the mainstream idea that somehow deficits and, you know, debt matter. You know, there was a, a thing I, I can't remember, like um, some of the kids at school got very nervous about various dates, you know. Sir, the world's going to end tonight. There was a guy that then it did it, so they picked another one and then another one. Well, it's kind of like that with government deficits and debt. You know, some geezer who's paid a lot of money out in the US has said, you know, if he gets past 60% Armageddon, you know, everybody will leave Japan and, you know, nothing happens. So, oh, well, better make it 80. Oh, it hasn't happened. Better make it 100. Well, I do, Japan is a great one, isn't it? Whatever it is, 200, 250% 
uh, government yet to DDP, they're doing all right. When is it coming? They've been talking for 30 years. I mean, I'll probably be dead. I mean, come on. If something's going to happen 200 years away, well, what, I, I don't think we need to worry about that. So it's all meaningless. It doesn't do anything. They're making it up. Right. So then, let's think about and recap and I can't see your faces, what I've said is, what I'm saying is, government spends by data entry, okay, destroys its spending by taxes, it's got to get its net spending at the right level, the government can't run out of money, okay, it's got the spreadsheet, you can't run out of something when you've got the spreadsheet, uh, and I often say, you know, when I was teaching, kids come in, all right, say a kid comes late, and I've got the, I've got the computer, I would say, sorry, Jimmy, can't mark your present. Why not, sir? I've run out of present marks. I'll have to go next door and borrow a present mark from my mate next door. See if you'll give me one. You might say you got a spreadsheet, you just enter it. So how can how can an issuer of something ever run short of something? Crazy. It's not possible. All right. Is it possible for an issuer to issue too much of something? Yeah, if you keep on doing it. All right, if you leave a large weight on the on the keys and it keeps, yeah, that's possible. Has it ever happened in a democratic economy, a democratic government facing no external constraints? Has anyone ever done that? No. Okay, so the government can't run out of money. It's complete nonsense. Okay, so well, why do they say they can? Now this is quite true. I'm not a major person in government. My feeling is, in general, they don't. Um, politicians don't understand. They just do as they're told. All right, people like Sarah, Prue, and Claire, they know a bit more about. Particularly Sarah, I think, has come across a few politicians in her time. Okay, they have very little inkling as to what actually how the monetary system works. And this is a crucial thing. Even if they did, would they really want to know? Would they want to go on to tell you and tell you that the deficit's too small? Or the government doesn't, taxes don't fund anything. You know, imagine that, you know, they wouldn't go down well in the Daily Express, would they? So they don't want to know. They don't know, and if they get an inkling, they ignore it. That's my opinion. Could be wrong. Right. Under the gold standard and fixed exchange rates, there was some traction to the government requiring taxes to fund itself. Not in the way they say, but if you think about it, if you had to back your currency, with gold, we don't do that anymore. We haven't been the gold standard for a very long time, the 1930s in Britain, and 1971 when Nixon called the gold window. If the government, for example, spent a billion and taxed back 800 million, there would be 200 million left of convertible currency that could be converted into gold at a fixed rate. So the government have to be very careful, wouldn't they, about how much they tax, how much they spend. They would be constrained by their gold reserves. And if there was a lot of un, untaxed spending out there, they might have to raise the bank rate or the interest rate to prevent the gold being drained. Now, these are all true, but there aren't any gold reserves now. You can try it. Go to the Bank of England with a £20 note and ask for your gold. They'll probably send you away. If they're nice, they'll swap your £20 note for a newer one as a gesture of good faith. There are no gold reserves. It's a fiat currency. Its value is underpinned by the fact that it's accepted by taxes and nothing else. Okay, I might be a shock. There ain't no gold, or very little gold. Okay, the other thing is, and I'm straying a bit, a lot of the time, a lot of people like, go back to the first slide, people believe that markets are the way we should go. So they think markets should control the way we behave. So in other words, the government's given away power to markets, and they like that. They don't want government to take control because they don't like them. You know, the old Reagan thing, you know, here I'm from the government, you know, I've come to solve your problem. The Milton Friedman stuff, you know. So they think markets work, and therefore, markets should have power. They don't trust governments. They want to have it. The problem with the narrative is, now, I don't agree with it, but let's say they're right for a moment. Let's say markets do work. 
Well, that sticks in many people's throats, but let's say they do. In which case, the government could give power to markets. But at the end of the day, the government has got the spreadsheet. The ultimate power always rests with the currency issue. Not the markets, not free banks and all these sorts of guys. We might give them power because we, we think they're good, but they never have it. It's a choice. And how do I know? Here's a good little case study, right? Here's the, let's say Thatcher's right. Okay, that the state funds itself from taxes and big banks and business, you know. So the, as such, as the state has no money of its own. It's only got taxpayers' money and businesses generated all. Right, that's what she said. We're on in the crisis. If she was right, what would have happened? Would you agree? The US government, British government, all the currency issues that have all gone to big business, one like Lehman Brothers and AIG, Bear Stearns that have all gone to these big business on bended knee, one the, the, the treasury, and said, please give us some money. Did they do that? Did they do that anywhere? And I mean, anywhere? No. It was all, and I mean, all the other way round. All right, so all the big businesses went to the states. Why did they go to the states? I don't mean the United States, I mean the states issue. Because they got the spreadsheet. You know, there's a famous quote, you know, from uh, Ben Bernanke, isn't there? Somebody said, you know, you're giving all that money to uh, big businesses. Is it taxpayers' money? And he goes, no, it's not taxpayers' money. We've got a big computer uh, and we just mark the numbers up on the account. So how do I know? Because in a crisis... You see, you see things, don't you, that otherwise might be hidden, okay? And I'll just give you a little example from history. Right, say, for example, okay, you were standing, I normally do a bit of jumping about now, say you're standing on the earth in about 1400, okay? You see the sun move around the earth, don't you? So would you agree it's absolutely obvious that the Earth is stationary, it does not move, and you can see the sun orbiting the Earth. Result. If you don't need to talk about it, you know, you wouldn't go in and see your wife and say, forsooth, Lady Margaret, you know, me thinks that the Earth is at the middle of the sun. It's automatic. You don't talk about it, do you? Because so if some guy comes on and goes, you got it wrong, you know. The Earth goes round the sun. You know, the way you fall off, it doesn't move. You must be mad. All right? Because it's obvious. Do you see what I mean? No. What I'm saying is MMT is changing the same system. The state is the monopoly issue. The currency can't run out. Obviously not. It might give money to markets. It might support them. But the crisis tells you a veil is drawn, isn't it? You know what I mean? You can see it. Go back to Copernicus. When you get Galileo with his telescope, you know, he watches the moons of Jupiter and things like that. This is new evidence where you think, let's put the two things. You're seeing the same things, aren't you? Standing on the earth, you see the sun go around. All right, what is happening here? You know, seeing the observations are the same. What is the theory it coheres against? When people like Galileo are coming along, you're getting anomalies, things that don't fit the old theory. Was it accepted? <laughs> no way. Now, same thing I was exactly the same thing. We're explaining things that work, that fit. All right, all these guys, oh, well, taxes, fund spending. Well, great, why well, wasn't why wasn't it all the states that went bust then? Not the big banks who had all the cash. Oh, don't know. Now, it ain't easy, you know, don't, don't get me wrong that, you know, Galileo wasn't, you know, all the guys who've been doing all the other theories, oh, well done, Galileo, you got me beat, you know, you, Copernicus and Kepler, you're the guys we like, all the other guys, like, you know, Tico, Brahe and all, they go, give them a round of applause, move aside, let them take over all the astronomies. Oh, come on, didn't happen. Now, you're in the movement, you, you know, you see it. This is powerful stuff. You know what I mean? It's, it's big news. All right? So when you, I am telling you how the system works, okay? Now, when you leave this talk, this is the danger. I'm being honest. Put the news on. 
You get some idiot like John Redwood saying, oh, we've got to reduce the borrowing. Who are you going to believe? John Redwood? You know, doesn't know the, the words to the West Northern Anth Welsh National Anthem or me, an experienced comprehensive school teacher from Middlesbrough. It's a non-starter. you got to believe me. Now, final then. Do they know the system and apply a useful fiction? I don't think so. All right? They're not clever enough to do that. They believe, and if they have an inkling, they don't go any further. It's bad for their career. I ain't got no career. All right? I'm not apologizing. I'll tell the truth. All right? If you were a Copernican astronomer, would you dare talk about it then? Now, obviously, you might get, you know, severely persecuted. Now you just kind of get mocked. And uh, I, I mean, Tony, Ben, you'll have heard it before. What tends to have new ideas. First of all, you ignore them. Then you sort of ridicule them a bit. Don't you laugh at them? And then you mischaracterize and then attack. Now, MMT has moved from the others. We've been attacked now. Why? Because they're a danger. And they're all nervous, the mainstreamers, because we've got the beating of them. You know, even comprehensive school teachers like me I can talk to guys from top universities and I outmaneuver and beat them every time. Because I've got the right model. See what I mean? It's easy. Right. I've talked a little bit about that already. Now, the post-COVID world, okay? I don't know how long I've got left. Shall I keep going, ladies? Okay, right. What insights have we got? Right. What you can see from MMT is the government can't run out of money. All right. When it spends, it draws resources to a particular use. That's, so if the government employed more nurses, all right, we don't need to worry about the money we spend paying their salaries. What we need to worry about is what those nurses could have done if they weren't nurses. So if you'd rather have them as marketing consultants or bankers, you might not want to do it. Whoa. But if you're not at full employment, you can employ more nurses and there's no cost, is there? No real cost. So once you understand MMT, you realize the constraints are not monetary, they're real. Okay, i.e. the real resources we have in any community, however you want to define, say, a nation state. So what determines Britain's future capability after COVID is, have we got the people who were trained and motivated? Have we got the infrastructure? If we want a Green New Deal? Have we got the technology? If we have, we can do it. If we haven't got the real resources, then we need to think about training our people and getting input. So it's not about the money, okay? And a good way to think about that is if we were all on a desert island, all right, marooned, and I was in charge, and I'd found a big bag of pink pebbles in a sack, and that was the money, and I started paying you guys to do the jobs I thought, and you all thought I knew what I was doing. If I ran out of pebbles, and we still needed fish catching. And we still needed the fire lighting. And so I can't employ you guys, so you just sit under a tree. People think I was mad. If we've got spare resources, people wanting to contribute, the government can employ them at zero real cost. No problem. It would only be a problem if said a full employment. If you keep on pumping money into the system, you will get inflation. We're not at that point. All right. So if now, obviously, the question, really a political question is right. So MMT is not a panacea. It's not like press the money and you can just do what you want. It's not saying that. It's saying that ultimately any community, its real resources determine what it can achieve. Good or bad. So democratically speaking, we need to employ our real resources, our people, our natural resources in the best way, sustainably for the environment, to protect future generations, to help our young people. These are the tough decisions to make. The government's budget isn't a tough decision. We've got limited resources. How are we going to use them to create a better world? 
Well, one of the cru crucial things is, first and foremost, pegging the ground, job guarantee. Now, what I mean by that, the government is the currency use, uh, sorry, the currency issuer. First up, it decides how big it wants. It's health service, it's education. How big should the public sector be? That's a political decision. Once it does that, it spends sufficient to move those real resources into the area. So we've all got a good education system, a good healthcare system, a good modern integrated transport system. Boom, they're done. They're in the bag. Now, there is resources not utilized for that are now free for the private sector to use. Now, provided the private sector operates environmentally sustainably, pays wages correctly, all the rules that they should abide, then the private sector then absorbs as much labor and other resources it wants. If any resources are left, particularly labor, that want to contribute, why would you leave them on a desert island? You've got 12 guys, you don't leave 200 tree who want to do something. So a job guarantee means you can go to a, a locally based, publicly funded, with a whole range of jobs, and you can negotiate, you know, hours, all these. It's a proper job. So you're part of the community. You are. And obviously, if the private sector want to get you out of the job pool, you know, they just have to give you better paying conditions. Now, some people say, oh, well, why do you need a job guarantee? The private sector does this. Well, if you think about it, if the private sector is brilliant and it works, there won't be anybody in the pool, will they? Because they'll buy anybody anywhere. Do you see what I mean? So, in a sense, I often use the example, you're going to walk across a ravine at 500 feet. You know, it's quite good to have a safety net. So, the government decides how big the public sector is. It's a democratic thing. You know, it goes through the elections. You can vote for whatever way you want, how big a health service you want, et cetera, et cetera. Then the private sector buys resources. What's left in the job guarantee scheme? It's not compulsory. People who are not able and willing to work, well, they're not counted as unemployed anyway. To be counted as unemployed, you are ready, willing, and able to work and don't have a job. So people who are ill, looking after a family, they get a basic income, which is good enough for them to live well and with dignity. What that is, is a political decision. So there's no poverty. You've eliminated that at source. Why would you have poverty? The government's got the spreadsheet. No worries. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Capitalism, all right? The idea of firms and that. Capitalists have to be made to compete. Now, currently, if you think about it, you know, I'm going a bit into politics. Governments deliberately run unemployment 5 7%. Make it up that, well, if we spend a bit more, we get inflation, and they make something up called the Nehru. If you're an economist, that's like a bit like a fair at the bottom of the garden. It's a non-empirical thing. Move aside and say, in particular, like to run the economy with 5 to 7% unemployment. Well, the reason for that is it disciplines the workforce. You've got fewer jobs than workers. That's no good. That means you're a rubbish firm. You can always find workers. We don't want to be doing that. We do the reverse. So if you've got a job guarantee, I don't know, I'm going to pick a figure, could be different, 25K a year, paying benefits, there you go, working in environmental sustainable projects. Any firm that wants to employ you has got to beat that. So you make the firms compete for the workers, not the other way around. If you're a good firm, you've got a great idea, you've got a nice innovative idea that's going to sell and enrich people's lives, you're going to employ people, and you're going to do a good job, you're going to invest in the environment, great. If you're not, if you want to pay people five quid an hour to serve burgers, you, you exit the industry. Now, I'm being tough here. I'm saying if a firm cannot produce a good quality good or service without damaging the environment, without, pay, you know, and paying at rubbish rates, then it exits the industry. The thousands of others will do a better job. It's not, you know, why should we kind to all? And we have to think as well on this point. Under COVID, the government's got the spreadsheet and it's deciding to support businesses. I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing. But it needs to be thinking, well, who are we supporting? Are these going to be post-COVID? Are the firms we're supporting, are they going to be, environmentally damaging are they going to pay their workers correctly 
Have they been hiding away their money in tax havens? These are the decisions that they're tough decisions you need to be thinking about. We don't need to go back to what we were before COVID, you know? I mean, it is political, but I mean, you might say, well, government doesn't need tax money, of course, as I said. But you might have guys who perhaps, you know, might have written in 2010, for example, that, you know, or oh, the government shouldn't be wasting money on welfare. Oh, now oh, I know I'm a multi-billionaire, but I need loads of money to run my airlines. Well, forget it. You don't get any free money. You don't come from anywhere. Well, they don't deserve it. The guys that said businesses are tough and, you know, governments rely on them. Okay, now's your chance to prove it also. You've got to be tough. All right? Tough on the rich guys. If they're that good, they can deliver. All right? So... And the other thing is, all right, what about poorer countries? What about countries who have got few real resources? You know, they, they can't feed themselves. They haven't got the end. Well, at the end of the day, even if they use MMT-based policies, you know, if they have no employment, so they had have, they have full employment, every, if at that point they're real resource poor, MMT can't solve the problem. It's made the best of a bad law. We need real resource transfers. So we need to countries that have got a lot of real resources, particularly manpower and technology and help and infrastructure to go and help them. We need to transfer that. We don't need to saddle them with debt. And that's like, like go back to the desert island example. If you had, you know, one community had loads of coconuts and fish and well built, you know, and everyone's working brilliant, we've got our huts, and then one over the way where no one's good at fishing, they haven't got any coconuts, you know, they they got all in the roof. That first community needs to send real resources, all right? That's what we've got to think about. You can end poverty only in, in Britain easily. We've got the real resources we keep it in, but in poorer countries, it's more difficult. We need real resource, and this takes a global effort to do that. It's tough, all right? Green New Deal, first thing. You know, when I talk to the Green Conference, they all say, oh, well, jobs are damaging. Because you've got to move away from this idea that jobs are environmentally damaging. If you went as a job guarantee pool person and wanted to be employed, for example, cleaning up beaches, playing music to people who, who had maybe a mental illness, reading to children, reading to old people. These sorts of jobs, they don't damage the environment. They help the environment. These are all valid jobs. They're a lot more creative than pretty much anything goes on in the city. That's another story. So that's fine. Jobs do not have to be environmentally damaging. They can be environmentally enhancing. Okay, so that's what we need to be thinking about, re-envisioning what work is needed. And if the private sector don't absorb people in that, then the state's got the spreadsheet. The, and, and remember, the limit is real resource capability. That underlies what we can do is underpinned by real resources and our political will to understand and use those resources. It's not about the spreadsheet. Okay, so little summary. Okay, we shouldn't support capitalist businesses unethically operating and so obviously, why would you hand over money to businesses that proceed to damage the environment? Free money, crazy. Well, worried about jobs. Well, why worry about jobs? You got a job guarantee. The government can set unemployment at zero if it wants with a job guarantee. So that's a hopeless excuse. It's pointless. So forget that. If people say that, worried about jobs, and that's the reason they're giving free money to awful businesses, they're either stupid or they're lying. There is no third option. So let's be definitive. Okay? Public sector. Public sector provides crucial services. We all need them. We've seen that more than ever in COVID. Health, education, transport, energy. Okay? The government... Keys in the money to move those resources into these areas. Yeah, if too many real resources are going into this area, there won't be as many left for other things. I accept that. You know, there's an opportunity cost for an economist. That's a political decision. Okay, private sector. 
Okay, the private sector, particularly small scale, provides innova innovation. Individuals might have great ideas that they want to change the world, young people. Let's give them that opportunity to start small businesses and meet and support medium businesses and even some big ones if they're environmentally enhanced, if they look after their workers, if they fit in the broad remit race. Don't just press buttons in to support any old business, okay? Um, an MMT gives us these deep insights. It's not a panacea, right? It's not saying, oh, just press the button and everything will be great. It replaces, if you want to think about it, the monetary constraint for the state with real constraints. There's a big debate, but it's not the same debate. The debate is about real resources. How big should the market sector be? These are real political debates. I can't answer those. All right, I have my opinions, but I can't be definitive on them. And so the final thing was a paper written by myself and Claire um, Sarah and Prue in 2020 is on their excellent website, okay? MMT should have a crucial role to play in the future practice of economics. We argue for an economics of focus on explaining economic aspects of the social world, all right? How does it work? Allowing economists to contribute along with other social scientists, the sociologists out there, anthropologists, psychologists, all people have wisdom and need to be working together to a deep understanding of human behavior and the reasons behind economic outcomes within an explicitly socially informed environment. Uh, that's the talk finished. I don't know how long it was. I hope it was about the right length. Uh, I'm over to questions. I think Sarah will moderate. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what will happen now. Hello, everybody. Um, we've got a question for Phil from um, Victoria Ullman, and she would like to um, for you to explain, Phil, uh, when the government says it has to issue bonds to cover the fallout from the crisis, as it does in every situation, it says it has to issue bonds, it has to borrow. Can you explain what those bonds are actually doing? Oh, OK and how um, they're not really a borrowing situation. Okay, if I go back to the gold standard, if you forgive me, um, what would happen under the gold standard? Remember I said, um, if the government spent money, issued pieces of paper and tax back, any money left, okay, potentially an individual could go to the central bank and convert that money into gold. So to stop them doing that or encourage them not to do that, the government will issue a bond. If you issued a bond, you give up your convertible currency and you get a bit of paper of, or a ledger entry, which is not convertible into gold until it matures. And to compensate for that, they will give you a rate of interest. So your choice is convert to gold, or buy a bond with a rate of interest. So obviously, rate of interest would tend to be raised by big deficits, okay? And bonds were required to compete against, if you like, the option to convert, which is Warren's phrase. Fast forward to your answer, okay? The government now spends by data entry. So you might say, well, why does it need to issue bonds then? Why does it just, why does it do it? Well, the answer is it does not need to issue bonds, all right? The government spends, and when it does, it introduces these things called bank reserves, which are the assets to banks. Now, those assets are not convertible into anything at a fixed rate. So the government is not required to issue bonds, okay? Why does it do so then, uh, to answer the question? It um, mainly is, a, I would argue, a legacy of the gold standard, all right? Um, because it's convention to do so, and it might be seen as being uh, monetarily weak if it didn't. And the other thing, reason it issues bonds for is because many pension funds and other are very safe 
asset, you know, if you get a 30, 40 year bond, it won't give you a lot of interest, but it's a safe and secure asset that you might hold. All right. And so obviously it depends on your pension fund. So the best way to think about bonds is it's an asset swap. So voluntarily, the government offers you an interest paying asset bonds on a non interest paying asset reserves. Is it required now? No. So it doesn't have to. The Bank of England, obviously, you know, there are different issues. People say we ought to do it. We ought not to do it. All of that is political and they are not operationally required. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Phil. I'm sure it does. And everyone's nodding in firmly in agreement. OK. <laughs> I can still only see Aidy. So for me, Aidy, thank you. You are my audience. So if you're like, he's laughing, so if Aidy's not like, I'm doing all right. Everybody else could have left the room now, but uh, don't, don't leave. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to feel terrible. Right, carry on. Um, we've got a question from Hannes. And Hannes is probably someone that, who's done quite a bit of study of economics. And he's, he's a mate of mine. So it he's might be a reminder. Friends. So he's a great a guy, man. He's a legend. He's a philosopher, and okay. he's a very clever guy. Right. With that fantastic introduction, I'm going to tell you his question. And from someone who has written on the heterodox paradigm and has argued that heterodox economists should work together, what role do you see for other non-liberal schools of thought after hypothetical fall of the present hegemony? Is there a space for other stories or ideas of an economy once once we've accepted the MNT lessons, in our opinion? Whoa. What do you now, think? Yes, is the answer. To the, yes. There is a place for others. Because what MNT does, in my opinion, is it gives the best explanation, rich insights how, of how the monetary system works. Okay? But you might argue, what about Marxism, which operates on a deep level of abstraction? I'm not a Marxist. But there are elements in Marx, I think, add to the insights of MMT. Some people say that post-Keynesianism has a lot in common with MMT, and MMT comes out of a post-Keynesian tradition. Post-Keynesians are an interesting school, quite disparate. Some of them are very antagonistic towards MMT, all right? Others kind of like it, but say, well, it's there already, you know? Others don't really comment. But there are people in MMT, I really, uh, in post-Keynesism, I really respect, and I'm a pluralist. So, essentially, uh, there are other schools. Institutionalism, I think, old institutionalism, there are lots of valuable insights in there. And I think MMT can work well. The one thing I'll say about heterodoxy is, is I think healthy pluralist debate between different scholars, Marxists, post-Keynesians, even, dare I say, new Keynesians, they're, and they are the mainstream, but healthy debate, it's fantastic, you know, insights can be drawn. So I'm all for that. The problem is, is when some scholars dismiss an entire school <laughs> You can't have, you know, you can't work with them because they won't move from square one, you know. So there are certain scholars who almost make a living out of criticizing MNT, for example. It's very hard to work with them, for example. So I'm not saying people would have to accept all of MNT, just that it sheds insight into certain areas. So in answer to Hannah's question, I'm very pluralist, as I know he is, and I see MNT as, as having scope to work with other heterodox scholars do i see that on the immediate horizon not particularly sadly but with new with a, a more pluralist economic curriculum in the future i can see that it's a possible goer you know so if any of you out there who are working in universities if you are you know get the mmt message out and also the pluralist message out you know get people thinking of using different ways of viewing the system working together you know maybe arguing a bit in a polite way, but that's what we want. So I'm all for pluralism. Is it going to happen in the immediate future? No, we have to storm the citadel of the mainstream and the walls are high and there ain't no Rapunzel. Thank you, Hannes. 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 Thank you,
all right, putting the hair down. There's, there's not much going on out there. We're going to take a fight. We've got to defeat the He's laughing at that last result. We need to beat the rest. Uh, yeah. Are there any more questions for you? No, no, we've had an offer. For, we're, we're reminded from Christian that the MMT podcast has um, episodes on bonds, on explanations from Stephen Hale on exactly how the bond system mm -hmm. works, as we have on our website. So yeah. There's loads of information out there, which hopefully this evening will be a springboard for people to go ahead and, and find out a bit more and learn a bit more. But definitely the MMT podcast has got some great episodes. Two of them include Phil Armstrong. I've got a few um, oh. things on my... You Can you see those on chat? Oh, I've got a question here. Oh, I've got one here from Frank Friedman. Why did you choose economics in the first place? And how, did it, how long did it take you to come to MMT? That's a question from Frank Friedman, which is a personal question. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, Frank and I are good Twitter friends. You know, uh, he tends to agree with me or I agree with him. So, yeah. Hi, Frank. Uh, good question. Uh, why did I choose economics? Well, when I, when I did A-levels a long time ago, so I'm an old guy, 1970s, I did maths, chemistry, biology, and they were too difficult. So somebody suggested to me I should do accounting at university. Uh, and then a mate of mine said, well, accounting is a bit boring, Phil. Why don't you do economics as well? So I thought, well, I've never heard of it. So I did economics and accounting at university. Absolutely, could, nothing against accountants. I couldn't do accounting. So I asked the professor to switch to economics. So it was a very roundabout route. Then I taught economics, and I learned economics as I taught. I got interested in post-Keynesianism, doing a master's, and then I came across a chap you might have heard of called Warren Mosler, uh, probably the most generous man I've ever met in terms of his time. I mean, he basically taught me all the questions I had about how the world worked. Because post-Keynesianism is great. It's like having a jigsaw with bits missing, all right? I knew the picture wasn't right, but I didn't can't work out what bits were missing. Warren filled it in, answered all my questions, you know. To me, it's definitely the most insightful analysis. So I got to it through a roundabout route, through meeting Warren, through his generosity about 10 years ago. You know, since then I've gotten all, a lot more of the big hitters, you know, like the Gims, uh, you know, Randy, um, Bill, of course, my mate Martin Watts out in Australia, quite a few others, James Juniper, Stephen Hale. I've got to know them later. Great bunch of people. So it's a great place to be. Right, we've got... Thanks, Phil. We've got one more question. Um, Phil, we've got a question from Wanda. She says, does, what does Phil um, think might have happened if Labour had won the general election in 2019 and implemented John McDonald's policies. Okay. What would the world look like now? Now, Sarah, can I pass that one to you first or do you want me to do it? Because I think you know more about John McDonald than me. I don't do know you... how the world would look. Okay, I well... I don't know. I'm not sure whether how much of what he would have been able to implement, he would have been allowed, the Treasury would have allowed him to get away with. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with Sarah. I, I think John McDonnell, nice guy. Sarah might correct me on it, but, you know, he met yeah. Bill and he, he kind of paid a bit of lip service to MMT. I just don't think he was brave enough to take it on. Uh, my view is a good guy, but he had the wrong advisors. You know, there were all, all those fiscal rules that were bringing in, like Ren Lewis and Mead where, I mean, not, not be used as a platform to be critical of individuals, but they're mainstreamers, you know, whether they are, whether they say so or not. And they don't get MMT, you know. Uh, to be fair, Simon Ren Lewis, he engages with it, but he doesn't get it. And he, he wouldn't accept it because he's a very famous economist, not going to recant. James Meadway, yeah, okay. And th these guys, to me, weren't the right advisors. They were just, they're not here to defend themselves. So, but essentially, I think, obviously, Britain would be a whole lot better off with Jeremy Corbyn in charge. You know, he's been proved right. But he would have taken a lot more effort from MMT. He would have had to get, well, particularly Bill Mitchell. 
who's a legend in you know, so hard working and diligent and understands the political world. His politics are right on the money as far as I'm concerned. If Bill could have got his feet under the table with John McDonnell, then the world would have been great. But I don't think that was necessarily on the card. Think, do you think, Phil, that um, prior to the election, the, the, um, the, the narrative against Labour was, oh, if Labour gets in, everyone will abandon. Invested will, invested will abandon the UK and there'd be disaster. The sky would fall in, which is what they always say. The sky would yeah, fall in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a risk, isn't it? Because if you understand MMT, you're the currency issue. So it doesn't really matter about investors, does it? Because if you've got a job guarantee, you know, all of that happened is more will go on the job guarantee. And also the thing about investors who are investors people just make it up you know does it mean sort of billionaire capitalists who exploit people well close the door on good riddance they're not of any use to anyone so uh, uh, goodbye to them we can all set the unemployment rate at zero so and also the crucial thing to remember is people like foreign exchange market dealers they are not ideologues and what would have happened in my opinion is if mmt was ever instituted. Initially, there'd be a selling of the currency, goes down a bit, you know, Britain gets more competitive, we've got full employment, a green economy, poverty's fallen to zero, inequality's down, the economy's doing really well. What are the foreign exchange dealers going to do? They're not stupid, they'll all be buying pounds. Of course they will. So all happened with MMT, within the, I couldn't tell you, I can't. Within a few months, the pound were going up, not down. That would be the problem. Everybody will want to invest in the pie because they're not ideologues. That's the thing. They're only interested in whether the economy does well or not. Now, if you think MMT is no good, then you would naturally say it'll drive it. But I think it'll work. So, and in any case, at the end of the day, the, the exchange rate, you know, people, oh, well, the investor, the money will go and the pound will crash big yawn, all right? For example, the government can always employ capital controls and prevent that happening. Would I think that was necessary, given what I've just said? No, because the money would be coming the other way. Should we do capital controls anyway to stop manipulative dealers uh, making money on the battle? Of course we should, you know? Why should we have people playing around with money for the... It's just like benefit themselves, no one else. So I have capital controls for ethical reasons. And the other thing is, right, and I'm going to stray a little bit here into morality and courage, right? If someone's saying to me, oh, well, we love the idea of dealing with poverty, having a Green New Deal, having a health service that works. We want to do all those things, but, oh, we don't do it. Why, oh, well, the foreign exchange market dealers will sell pounds. So what you're saying is let's roll over and sacrifice all of those good things because we think about the city when we control them anyway. The time, you know, like, we are, it's can't be a diem. You've got to seize the day. Because at the end of the day, all these city guys know the government's in charge. Of course they do. Otherwise, we wouldn't lobby them so closely. We've given them the field to play in. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have an efficient banking system. I'm not saying that all people in finance are doing a bad job, so they're doing a great job. But they do a good job or otherwise because we've given them the playing field to play in, if you see what I mean. And big business people know that. They know, they know the details of the system, but they know the importance of the state because it's the currency issue. It sits at the top of the pyramid, you know, and that, a lot of that came in uh, Bill Mitchell and um, Thomas Farsi's excellent book. I'm going to plug that brilliant book, Reclaiming the State. All these big business, neoliberalism, neoliberal oriented guys, if to use a set phrase, they've all mounted huge charm offences on the state because they know how important the state is. If the state wasn't important, they wouldn't bother them. You know? Why would all those cool Britannia guys go into number 10 with Tony Blair? They won't be bothering with him because they know, well, he's, he's in the government. You know, he's the man. Thanks, Phil. Brilliant. True. 
Okay, uh, we've come to the end of our first online event and uh, Sarah, Claire and I would like to offer you, all of you, our sincere thanks for attending this really new venture, which we are hoping to repeat again in the future. So watch this space. We'd also like to thank, uh, to extend our thanks to Phil for such a stimulating and informative presentation. And we hope that you've enjoyed it, but more importantly, that you will take away with you some food for thought and be inspired to learn some more. Now, if we really want to change the world, it can only start by acquiring knowledge to reject the toxic economic ideology of past decades, which will in turn enable us to explore what we can do collectively to find solutions to the challenges we face. It upsets the notion of monetary affordability and allows us to ask the very real questions about how we turn the economy around and how we can address climate change, all in the context of sharing available finite resources fairly and equitably to create the sustainable world that we are seeking, a world where public purpose informs and directs government policy. So uh, just for those people who, who, who don't know us, um, we do have obviously a presence on social media, but we also have a website um, which, has got, which has got comprehensive resources from facts to fact sheets and links to further information, videos and books, as well as a growing MMT database of published academic papers which are accessible through Zotero. We also take a weekly look at the news on economics and public service through the lens of MMT. So whilst we are a group of unpaid volunteers, the organisation does have ongoing costs to keep us afloat. So if you could consider a small donation to our organisation, you will find the uh, donation link on our website. Oh, and just before I, I, end, I, I conclude, um, if you, you can sign up for our newsletter if you want to be kept up to date with events and such like. So to conclude, thank you all again, particularly uh, Phil, for being here and a very good evening to you all. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.